Always another podcast, and we've got Scotty, oh, as we good. promised. He's here with us. How you doing, man? How's everything uh, going over there? What's, what's the weather? Uh, it's very cold. It's minus two today. <laughs> yeah, it's freezing over here, man. Like, really cold. We went out for a um, had this Christmas event in town on Saturday night, and I took the kids, and it was that cold. Poor Harvey was crying because his fingernails are that cold, so I had to buy him another pair of gloves, and we were out to keep his hands warm as well as giving him mine and l- legit it was that cold where I, I had no sensation in my hands. It's just a different, it's a different beast. Bad. So- and I'm, we're obviously so, you know, foreign to it. Yesterday it was like four and I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh it's, it's a bit warmer today. Like it doesn't seem as, as icy. And I'm just like, I can't believe that's what I'm associating as warmer. But anyway. Bartley's going to be a shock to your system. I can't, do you know, I can't wait. I'm debating getting one of those app things that counts down the days just so that, when my alarm goes off at like 4.30 in the morning, I'm just thinking about that first thing. Honestly, I've seen people that have come into the retreat that have those countdowns on. Yeah, that's yeah. so good. Yeah, I should do It's going to be mega. Come around quick, man. It's almost end of year, so. Oh, yeah, it's going to come real quick. So we had to organize a prep coach potty end of year event, and I was going over the footage because I created a reel for it, and it's obviously all the footage from last year, and Scotty, you're in it. And uh, I was like, oh, no, he's not going to be there this year. I can't believe it. I did see that this morning. Yeah, yeah. So we have our end-of-year catch-up. Last year was awesome. This year's going to be even better. Uh, It's going to be on the 17th of December at 10 a.m. at uh, Powerhouse in Bayswater. Absolutely amazing gym, massive. I think we need something that size just because there's going to be so many people floating around. There's so much equipment there. So it worked really, really well last time. So Really, really keen for it. Really keen to uh, wrap up the year and thank everyone for their support and just just meet people and, and have fun and train. Good news that I can um, somehow get a positive scan result and not have to wear the moon boot to the uh, to the meetup, but I don't know that it's likely, man. Yeah, what's the progress on the boot, on the moon boot? Taking ages, man. I'm, I've got another scan next week, which we've been waiting to uh, to see if the bone that separated has kind of fused back. So fingers crossed. I get some uh, good news, but like from the few instances where I've taken it off and sort of walked on the inside of the shoe because it's the fifth metatarsal, still a bit of ache and a bit of pain, and it's been seven weeks. So I don't know, man. I don't know whether it's just because I haven't moved it in in a certain way that that pain's still there, or whether there's still a little bit of separation. But anyway, so I'll stay positive. And worst case, I'm going to be there with a boot. You should get people to sign it, man. You know what I wanted to do? Someone might be able to help me with this. It's, it's this is what's good having a, a great audience of listeners. I've got a Jordan, right? Yeah, I'm going to hold up on screen for those that are watching on YouTube. So I've got this Jordan, right? See this Jordan here? So you can see this Jordan, red, black, white, right? Yeah. Now, look at the moon boot, also red and black. Oh, no way. I need someone too- to help me turn, get this moon boot with a white Nike tick and make it look like my Jordan. So at least I don't feel like such a cockhead when I have to wear this fucking moon boot out of it. But see how close it is? Not too bad. Yeah. You better just get a sticker made. Got to find some Nike, some white Nike stickers. Someone will be able to do it for you. Someone creative, that can just even with a paint pen. That's what I was thinking. Liquid paper. <laughs> I, I know. No, I have someone paper. that w- that would be able to do it, bro. Cam yeah. printing. So they do wraps on boats, cars, all of that. They'll be able to do it on that. <laughs> I'm gonna get a carbon fiber wrap on my moon boot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll uh, I'll give him a message to say, man, I need something. It's a little out there. Book the only thing is, I'll probably need your boot to measure it up and do all that. It'll be worth it for the meetup. I don't reckon that would have ever been done before. Right, let's do it. You get a little side hustle just for people that break their foot. You can just get Jordan boots. First on, man. First on. Let's do it. <laughs> That's crazy. All right, let's get stuck into some questions. We um we only got a couple done last week because obviously we wanted to hear everything about Scotty and what's going on there. So let's kick off some questions this week. And I love this one. Top tips to navigate the Christmas season. So it's all coming out now. There's posts on all the top tips that all the influencers are putting out at the moment. And they're all well and good for like, you know, lifestyle clients. But, you know, people that listen to this, they're serious about their physique and their training. They're most likely competitors. So I think you've got to delve a little bit deeper when you try to answer a question like that and really understand what is someone's goal. If you're in comp prep, the advice will be completely different to you if you're someone that goes, I don't care what I look like at the end of the season. I just want to enjoy myself, advice will be completely different. And then also too is, where are you going to be? If you're working through that whole time, you're going to be home, probably most likely can stay pretty adherent to your training, to your diet. You'll be able to put in some flexible meals within there and enjoy yourself socially. 
if you're going away and you're going camping, then diet might be all right because you're going to be bringing your own food, probably meal prepping your own food, but you can't train. If you're going somewhere to another city, like maybe Sydney or Brisbane, going to stay in a hotel, meal prep will be difficult. Probably have to eat out, eat out a lot, but you can probably train a hell of a lot because there's, there's gyms there, maybe even in your hotel. So it really depends on where you're going to be, what you're going to be doing. Also, what lifestyle do you have now? Are you a regular nine to five worker? Meaning if you're going to have time off, your routine is going to be completely different. If you're someone like us three boys, we work for ourselves, holidays don't, don't feel much different because we pretty much come and go as we please and we, we still work and our days aren't very structured. So you know, even for us, a public holiday doesn't even feel like a public holiday. We're, we're still doing the same thing. We're not going into the office or doing anything differently. And then the last thing would be is you also got to look at who's giving the advice because sometimes they have their own bias. So if you're going to, the person giving the advice is a coach or an influencer that maybe is in prep, their advice would probably be a little bit more biased to you sticking to your plan and your structure and being meticulous. But if you've got someone who is used to be a competitor, now is more of a lifestyle person and is also going away on a trip during that time, their advice probably be more biased to just do what you want, make sure you have fun and who cares about training and nutrition. But I think one of the most important thing is whatever you're doing, make sure you do things that are regular things you would do within human nature that bring joy, which is be around people and make sure that you socialize and you enjoy yourself. Don't sit at home, stay away because you want to be adherent with your diet or your training and you don't want to go out and socialize with people because, you know, during this time of year, we get to do things and see people that normally we don't get to see and enjoy their company with. So I think that would be the biggest priority if you're looking at trying to navigate the Christmas season at the moment. What do you think, MG? Yeah, man, like if let's be specific to someone who's in prep, there's probably a lot of people who are, you would have known Christmas was going to be part of this when you decided to do the comp. So you just got to remember that. Like ultimately, we I think we spoke about it, was it last week's episode or the week before? I was like, when you set a goal this big, right, you have to be willing to say fuck off to everything else. And I'm not saying you can't hang out with people. You should still do all of your family events, but you're just saying fuck off to the food because ultimately your goal is bigger and better than that. Than that. And guess what? Next year, you're not going to be prepping and you can probably enjoy Christmas a little more. I think the point that you made before was very, very valid and something that gets skipped over a lot of the time. The opinion that you're going to hear on social media is probably going to be relevant to what that influencer or that person is doing at their life at that point in time. And remember that... Three years ago, when someone who's now telling you that life's short and enjoy time with family and have that piece of chocolate and have that cake, three years ago and they were prepping, I bet they would have told you to fuck off if you had have um, said that to them. So it's a really, really good point and something to understand. So think about who's giving the advice out. But my comment will be specific to those that are in prep. You always knew that Christmas was going to come. You know, if it's something that's really, really, really important to you, maybe you need to have a conversation with your coach about how you can potentially manage that day where there may be a little bit of a system of some high nutrition um, with a give and take where potentially you might increase expenditure in the day before or the day after, which is I know a system that, you know, the three of us use sometimes. Um, but you got to remember that the goal that you set was bigger than just one day of eating. And ultimately, MT summed it up. It's the time that you're spending with your family and friends, the gift giving, the laughing, the photos, the memories that should be more important than the food because 12 months from now, no one's really going to remember what you ate on that day. What do you think, Scotty? Yeah, everything you guys said, completely agree with. I think from a, if you are to go back to what MG said, if you're in prep, I think how you periodize your nutrition in the lead up to it. So for example, a lot of the, the athletes that I have in prep for season eight at the moment, some of the stuff we've been touching on in their check-ins this week is I've actually built in a little bit of a buffer over either the day before, so Christmas Eve and Christmas Day or Christmas Day and Boxing Day. But equally, that's been built into the timeline to afford them that. And it's not go and eat ad libitum and you know go go hard. It's just they might have their usual three of their five meals and maybe that their Christmas lunch is just make sure you have some protein, three or four different colored vegetables on your plate. You know, if you want to have a glass of wine or if you want to have a beer, something like that, if that's something that's important to you culturally as well. Um, but obviously it's context and just being sensible. But in terms of other people's perceptions of you should have that or you should do this, I think if you're competing, this is not the first time you'll be exposed to something like that. So like we always say, your why needs to supersede any time 
any sh- sort of or short term, you know, satisfaction pertaining to eating a meal or the palatability of something or someone encouraging you to do something. Because if you lean into, oh, they're really tempting me and I really want to have it, it's a slippery slope. You do it once, you do it twice before you know it, you know, you're not even dieting anymore. So I think when you do embark on season A, it's something that you have to factor in that you're going to be dieting around Christmas time. But equally, you can still build in some flexibility around that to an extent. But it's not really any different in season B where on a Friday night, everyone's going to get takeaway pizza or fish and chips and you're going to sit home and you're going to eat your meal that you would usually eat. You just sort of have to be at peace with it. But I think if you're so hyper food focused and you lean into it, you just make it worse. I've never dieted over that period, but equally, I don't think it would really you know, worry me. We've all come out of season B preps before and you don't necessarily view Christmas as a way to just eat like an asshole and justify being able to do it because you're not dieting. My last prep was season A. Yeah, my biggest thing, man, was across that period was I was just relating being lean over the summer period. So that one day really didn't make any fucking difference. You know, everyone else got to nine o'clock that night and was so full and felt like horse shit. And I had to flatter stomach there and I was like, fuck, I feel great. So like, there's always positives to take out of it. And you can even influence some of your lifestyle things on others. So it's like after you have a massive Christmas meal, everyone all, always gets that sleepy, I'm going to have a snooze now. Maybe you can say, does anyone want to come for a walk, you know, help? digest your food a little bit better you can get some steps in you can engage in conversation like yes christmas it's nice to enjoy food and if you're someone that enjoys alcohol to have a drink with you know your family but essentially it's the people that you're spending it with and the memories that you're sharing and as mg said wouldn't be able to tell you what anyone in my family had on christmas day other than they probably had some roast turkey and probably some desserts on it like no one really pays any attention and again those that are paying attention to that it probably says a bit more about them than it does about you. So I think, like we always say, those that matter won't mind and those that mind don't really matter. Yeah, definitely through, for a season B prep, I had to diet through Easter, but also for season A preppers, they're dieting through Easter too. Obviously, it's not as social, there's not a lot going on as the summer period. There's only really just the Easter, some people, depends if they're religious or not, have to really navigate. But I remember when I was there, now I come from a big Italian family where there's food everywhere. And I pretty much just put my meal prep, put it on the same plate that everyone else had. I sat there, I ate, everyone looked at like, oh, your food looks good. And that was it. The one conversation was had, everyone was enjoying their food. I was enjoying my food. I was enjoying everyone's company. We're having a laugh. That was lunch. Went to another other side of the family for dinner. Exact same thing. Plunked my prep food on the plate that everyone else had. Knife and fork there. Ate with everyone. No different, right? So mm-hmm. it can definitely be managed and navigated. I think too is even if you're not in prep, even if you're in the, the off season or not at a dieting phase at all, remember that you don't need to be like a normal person. You don't need to have to be like Uncle Bill who, you know, downs six beers you know, at dinner time, right? You can just be yourself and not feel pressured to drink or overeat just because everyone else has gone for seconds and thirds. Just do whatever you're comfortable with doing. Don't feel pressured to, to be un- anyone else but yourself. And you know what's funny? It's like prep and dieting, especially long dieting, brings out the desire to have things that you don't really want and, and sometimes have never even had before. It's amazing when people will sit around a table, there's 10 weeks into a diet, someone has a piece of cake and a beer and they're like, oh, what I would do for that. But if you go like back into you know their, uh, their off season or when they had flexibility and ask them when the last time they had a cake and a beer was together, they'll probably say never. So I think you just got to remember that it really does make you just want what you can't have purely for the reason that you're sacrificing. And it's really important never to forget that you don't really want it. Okay. Next one, this is on this topic too. And I'm going to go with you first, Scotty, is how much does alcohol affect muscle growth? And is it detrimental to do a once a month binge drinking episode? And does it affect my gains? Now, maybe you want to talk about alcohol and muscle growth just in general but maybe you want to talk about the effects of alcohol on your metabolism, even on fat loss. So that's your goal too. Yeah. So alcohol, firstly, it's a drug. So in terms of you consuming it, your body doesn't like having alcohol in the bloodstream. So, you know, from a metabolic perspective, as soon as you ingest alcohol, you can forget utilizing any other substrate because your body's number one goal is to clear it from the bloodstream. So in terms of building muscle, um, we know that it does decrease testosterone levels. There's a reason why. I think um, Andrew Huberman did a really good podcast. It was a little while ago. If anyone that's 
Interesting, crazy. Matt. Um, um, yeah, yeah, that was a, a good one. And again, this is not to begrudge anyone that drinks each to their own, but I think as always, context is probably important. But if you're someone that's serious about their bodybuilding, is alcohol going to be deleterious to your ability to you know, maximize hypertrophy? Yeah, it probably is. But then equally, if you're someone that needs to have some balance and you enjoy having I don't know, a glass of wine when you go out for dinner with your partner, is that going to be compared to, say, the 21-year-old that goes out every second weekend and gets blasted, but they're really good and on point with their food for the rest of the week? It's not the same thing. So I think, like with anything, you know, a little bit of something is okay, but if you're going down the other path, obviously too much is, is gluttony, but in the sense of alcohol it is obviously going to be disadvantageous in terms of trying to progress and to be optimum. So to simplify it, it's definitely not optimum to be consuming alcohol if you're serious about your bodybuilding endeavors or any kind of physical attributes that you're trying to improve. In terms of metabolically, like when you're dieting, like I just said before, when you're doing ingest it, you basically blunt all of the other exercise metabolism pathways. So let's say that I'm sitting down, I'm having a pizza, I'm having a few beers with that. Your body needs to clear that ethanol from the blood before it can look at metabolizing the fat and the protein and the carbohydrate in the pizza. So you are going to see a reduction in your um, energy expenditure, but equally, and this not to encourage binge drinking, but in terms of an of a metabolism pathway, if you're having one drink versus if you were having like say four or five quickly, you're using it like a different pathway, so to speak. So you have a a system which is called the MEOS system, the microsomol ethanol oxidizing system. So it's a fancy long name, but basically what it does is when your body senses that you're ingesting copious amounts of alcohol in a short period of time, it upregulates its ability to be able to metabolize it like anything the human body is designed to adapt. So it does enhance that thermic effect, if you will, in terms of the cost of metabolizing it a little bit faster. So you will see an upregulation in that versus if you had four drinks in an hour versus if you had one drink every hour for four hours, you would probably clear, not you probably, you would clear the four drinks a little bit faster. So not that I'm encouraging you to do that, but if you were to do it, technically you would get rid of that a bit quicker, but it's around about for one standard drink. So one unit of alcohol is obviously seven calories. So you're looking at around about 70 minutes to clear if you're looking at, say, one standard drink, which has got 10 units of alcohol, I think, doesn't it? Yep. Yeah. So if you walk off that premise, you're looking at around about 60 to 75 minutes, depending on the size of the human, to clear like one standard drink. So you can see pretty quickly that if you're having three, four, five, six, and you're also eating on that side of it as well, it's pretty easy to overconsume. And bearing in mind that alcohol is never just alcohol. If you have a beer, there's sugars in that, there's carbohydrates. So um, your body has to wait before it can obviously start metabolizing that. So the likelihood of you gaining adipose tissue in that period is obviously, you know, very, very high because it's very easy to enter a surplus plus you're blunting metabolic capacity in the process as well. Yeah. I think in that podcast, man, I think he mentioned that the the upper echelon for limits per week to avoid brain atrophy was two standard drinks per week. Yeah. Even things like, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's some research to support that it, more than two standard drinks a week, you, there's a higher increase in breast cancer in females as well. That was one of the things that they were touching on. There's there's a, a ton of other negative associations that go with alcohol. So short answer, it's definitely going to affect muscle growth. Yes, and it's definitely going to affect exercise metabolism as well. So if you're someone that's dieting, there's no way that you should be consuming alcohol. Okay, I've got a different question. So I saw a fellow competitor post recently about uh, sweating during the night their post comp i'm experiencing this as well and i didn't realize that it was reverse diet related why is this happening and is there anything that i can do to stop it so sweating during the night post comp when in in the reverse diet phase yeah, sometimes think- it can be associated with someone who's been overfeeding so eating too much again when you're eating and you're having an overfeed or if someone has a binge the likelihood is that they're not binging on carrots and broccoli and, and celery and, and obviously non-processed foods. They're usually foods that come from packets, they're lollies or they're shitty foods. And there's quite a significant amount of sodium in that. We've spoken about, again, if you revert back to your body is designed to acclimate to the environment that you expose it to in terms of the food going in, as well as obviously, you know, external factors. But if you were consuming lots of that, sometimes or you're having a large large overfeed everyone's probably had a moment in time where they've had a massive meal and then afterwards once that digestion starts to kick in they start to get really hot and almost like sweaty 
as a result if you see an increase in core temperature. But in terms of expenditure, your body's working very, very hard. I think a lot of people don't understand the thermic effect of feeding and how it works, the cost of metabolizing it. So like, let's say if I'm eating a chicken breast and let's say that it's 100 calories worth, it may cost me anywhere from 15 to 20 calories to be able to metabolize that. And if you go down a path of eating lots and lots and lots of food, there's obviously a cost to that as well. Plus there's the digestion recoil. And then if there's also an excess amount of sodium, um, sometimes an easy way for your body to be able to clear that. Obviously, sweat is a way of cooling the body down. So if it's upregulated and it's very hot and uh, it obviously needs to cool and obviously your blood sodium levels are elevated, sometimes that can be a way of clearing that out um, as well. A lot of athletes will usually associate, well, I've had people in the past say, I feel like I'm sweating heaps and I just stink. And it's because it's a lot of that stuff clearing and leaving the body. Scott, what about for a female competitor who got quite lean and is coming out of the reverse and is potentially having a bit of a shift in their hormone profile? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously everyone's endo changes, you know, pretty drastically. We see a massive reduction in sex hormones towards the back end. Yep. And so sometimes there is a correlation between that as well. Sometimes I think there's, I was reading a, a few months back, there's some stuff around um, being lower in certain um, blood markers as well. The exact ones off the top of my head, it escapes me. I'd have it somewhere. I'd have to have a look. But that that is definitely part and parcel of it as well. You are seeing some of those changes to, to your physiology because you're essentially going from one specific state to crossing over to, to another. But without knowing like what's the temperature of the room that you're sleeping in, you do know like what are you wearing? There's so many different things that, that come with that. But equally... For a lot of athletes, like when we get a lot leaner, we have less body fat on us. And obviously, body fat isn't designed to just make us look a little bit softer. It's to help us to survive, to keep us warm. You know, there is that thermal component to it. So sometimes as body composition starts to come back on as well, you will notice that. It's like if you were super shredded, you could be walking around, you could go for a walk on a 25 degree day and you're still, you know, a little bit chilly. You're not sweating versus if you're a bit bigger, you're carrying a bit more body composition you're a bit sweaty, a bit clammy. So things like that can um, can affect as well. Yeah, I think a lot of people are going to get a lot of value from that answer, man. Right, let's move on to another one. Explain the science behind depletion and carbon. And then there was also another question, which I put straight under it was, what are your thoughts on no carb during peak week? And I was mentioning that their coach had them on really low carb leading up to the show and then decided to also not do carbs during peak week at all. Okay, so this is a peak week question around like, why would you deplete? <clears throat> and carb up and like, what's the science behind it? Like, why are we doing it? Yeah, so when we deplete carbohydrates, so firstly, whenever you're consuming carbohydrate, you're blunting lipolysis. So lipolysis, um, we've talked about this you know, multiple times, but it's the term that we use to, it's basically the body's way of oxidizing free fatty acids. So adipose tissue is broken down into to tags, your body metabolizes it and then uses it to produce ATP. So when we deplete carbohydrate, we obviously get super, super flat. Sometimes we'll use it um, in a peak week if we need to dig them a little bit more. But most people are chasing that the super compensation effect where you run really, really low carbohydrate, you suck them down really, really low, and then you can push in a large amount of carbohydrate in a short window of time. And it allows you to saturate muscle glycogen stores. And so what happens when you are depleted for a few days, you'll you'll probably find the physiques a little bit watery, a little bit washed out. And obviously it makes sense because there's less, um, well, there's essentially if you've depleted properly, there's virtually no muscle glycogen stores. We store glycogen in our muscles and also in the liver. And so when you replete or you replenish glycogen stores, you're able to essentially bring that physique to life. So that carbohydrate, you know, goes to the muscle. It requires, I think it's 2.7 mils to be precise, but it's 2.7 to 3 mils one gram of carbohydrate to partition and storage. Um, so that's going to go to the muscle. Obviously, your muscles are largely made up of, of fluid, of water. So you're drawing water into that intracellular space. And the best analogy is to think of a balloon. You know, when you have a balloon that might have helium in it, and after a week, it has that kind of saggy, still got a little bit of air in it, but it doesn't look as as like tight and as poppy versus you put some more helium in it and it expands and it becomes super, super tight. And if you don't have a lot of body composition between, you know, the muscle and obviously where, you know, your, your skin is essentially. So on the outer layer, then obviously it's pushing on the skin and that's where you can see some of those people that have those 
really deep striations and cuts through their muscle belly, as you can see, because there's virtually no adipose tissue there. The likelihood is that they've achieved complete muscle glycogen saturation. So that muscle's nice and full. You put a bit of a pump in it and you get some blood in there. And obviously it presses against the skin and you get a lot more detailed, refined look. So that is essentially what we're looking for. But you're usually not going to see a huge drastic if you've got someone that's just like hovering around, you know, roughly where maintenance is and they're not depleted and they're not like, I guess, fully topped up, you're looking at like maybe five, 10 percent. But if you're talking about someone that's completely dug to the very, very bottom depleted versus someone that's topped up, you know, the difference can be night and day. It can be the difference between someone looking incredible versus looking really washed out and really crappy. So that's why we use it. But I think a lot of coaches probably go a little bit and even athletes a bit too hard in terms of thinking that you need heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps. Bearing in mind that unless you're a massive, massive human, most guys are probably only going to be able to store between 450 to 550 um, grams of carbohydrate in terms of to be able to achieve complete saturation. Obviously, you've got to factor in the cost of using that carbohydrate with your daily endeavors and females even less. But it's one thing to push it in and that's getting it to stick as well. And that's where we would usually pair it with some fats. Usually, you'll see people... Coaches, we we're searching for a look, we find it. And then once we find it, we want to try and hold it. Um, and then obviously intramuscular triglycerides, like a lot of people ask, why would you have fats still leading into it? And obviously the advantage is to, to top up um, intramuscular triglycerides as well, because again, that could be the difference between adding an extra 700 to 800 grams you know, of, of quality fullness to one's physique. So there's, uh, there's that as well. But the reason that we use depleting carbohydrate or running lower intakes, especially when we're dieting is because as I said before, anytime that you're ingesting carbohydrate, you know, you're blunting lipolysis and your goal is to obviously liberate as much out of adipose tissue as you can in order to get someone as super lean as you can. But in terms of peak week, why would you go low carb all the way through? If you're someone that's like stage ready and you're running low carb, it would make absolutely no sense to me. Logically, I would have, I don't have an answer for that because it, it's the exact opposite of what you would want to be doing. If so, if someone's not lean enough, for sure, you know, you could dig them all the way through and then maybe push in a little bit. Or if you had someone that just wasn't in shape at all, and this is the other thing, sometimes you'll see people who are probably like still 12, 15% body fat, but they're doing a carb up. It's not really going to make a difference because you're not going to see any enhanced, you know, progression from an aesthetic perspective because you got to be super super sharp in order to be able to notice that difference so you got to be able to get super sharp get really really lean inside out peeled and then you can look at manipulating you know substrate to be able to maximize the look but i think too many people probably focus on that last little five percent versus diet really really hard get super super shredded and then worry about making that. Because if you've got someone that's peeled, you, you're talking about maybe increasing the look by maybe 10%. Otherwise, on most days, and this is where you will hear athletes say, I looked amazing during the week whenever I'm, you're working out and you're probably on lower food then. So you don't necessarily always need heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps for the risk of of uh, of spilling. So hopefully that answers it. Yeah, so the only reason why that person would have done low or no carb or no carb up at all is maybe because they weren't lean enough. But you mentioned a good point Sometimes you may look good leading up into the show, even if your carbs are low, and you thought to yourself, oh, just, just leave me here, I'm good. But um, you can really tell the difference between someone that's flat and someone that's full. And if we're in those categories where muscle matters, it's going to be really, really important to make sure you do not come in flat because it'll very, very tell on your physique straight away. And yeah, another thing that you mentioned, right. which I just wanted to, to go back over again, is that the depletion component isn't done to help the carb up component. The only reason why they're depleting is so they can get more fat loss, right? Not because they need to deplete so that the carb up works. Unless they're looking at using that super compensation effect where you're running drastic, drastic, drastic low carbohydrate, and then you're going to push in like 1500 grams of carbohydrate. But equally, again, it's a, a big risk like here. a risk for reward. I think it's easier to be able to get your athlete in shape early. And again, hopefully you've built in into your timeline sufficient time to be able to test rather than driving blind. Usually the very first show of the season, there's an element of trial and error because you can have the perfect game plan and you're always going to have to troubleshoot in order to regulate. But if you've run two, three-day refeeds in the past and you know that on day three of the refeed, and this is where you want your coach hopefully to be able to 
track the look, track the data. Okay, on day two, we looked incredible. Towards the end of day three, wasn't as great. Comparing the athlete's biofeedback, my pump was incredible on day three, but the day afterwards on day four, it was still really, really good, but I probably didn't look as sharp and as detailed. Okay, well, that's really valuable because then when it comes to peak week, we know that you know one day is okay and two day we're really getting somewhere and day three was a little bit too much. So that's why we'll usually, well, one of the, the interventions that I like to employ is if you're gradually feeding up and then I'll usually pull back a little bit the day before once we find that look. And typically you shouldn't need heaps and heaps and heaps unless you're just not responding how you want to because everyone knows the night before a show, what are you doing or in the afternoon? You get your tan and then you're just sitting on the couch. So that carbohydrate's not really going anywhere, especially when you factor in that in terms of substrate utilization, we're working off ideally depending on what heart rate or or energy systems that we're biasing towards. If you're walking to the fridge, going to the bathroom, just day-to-day living, like that is going to be primarily fueled as a result of fat, not as a carbohydrate. You know, for your body to really switch in and maximize using carbohydrate or using glycogen that's already stored, you know, you need to be exercising hard, recruiting lots of um, lots of muscle fibers. And if you're not really doing that and you're not elevating your heart rate, then you, you're not chewing through that carbohydrate and just vanish into thin air. Yeah. Whereas I feel like a lot of people maybe don't understand that. So it's just basics. So is there ever a worry that say you're full, you carved up correctly, you're at the show, could you pump up too much and deplete too much glycogen and actually go flat? If you're fully topped up, unless you're pumping up for like four or five hours, maybe. But I mean, the NBA show is a perfect example where we I ran into that problem where I was topped up, my body churns through it, and equally the stage times were delayed. Mm-hmm. And so a 45-minute pump up turned into like three hours. And so when that, if that does ever happen, and sometimes it happens at shows, then it, you usually will need to just keep feeding. But again, it's a knowing what to have and how much of it to have as well, because you don't want a lot of food volume in your stomach. So that's where if it's things like snakes or if it's two rice cakes with some honey, if you know that you know 30 to 40 grams of carbohydrate is going to go in pretty uninvasively, anything more than that, you're probably not going to be chewing through it unless you're going crazy pumping hard, given that energy expenditure in a, on a normal training session where you're training the house down in the gym, you're probably burning at the back end of prep, like maybe 400, 450 calories an hour. So if you think about that in reality, if you're pumping up backstage, you're not going to that level at least. If you worked off half of that as a premise that if you said that 150 to 200 calories an hour in terms of food going in, that's going to be more than enough. I always tell people, don't ever worry about that. Like just pump up hard, just go for it. Don't, because you hear sometimes coaches say to other people backstage, oh, you're going to go flat. Don't pump up too hard. I'm like, nah, just go as hard as you can. Like go hard. You should feel like you're getting a pump and a burner. That's a workout. Whenever you look your best at the gym, it's because you're working out the hardest, right? So you want to emulate that when you're pumping up backstage. You really want to make sure that you're giving it. You obviously don't want to be tired and huffing and puffing. You're walking on stage and you can't even control, you know, your breathing. Like you don't want to be doing that, but you, you want to be going pretty hard in your pump up. Yeah, you're not gonna you're not gonna lose your pump from doing three rounds of banded fucking pulls, which we see backstage. You're like, am I losing my pump? Am I losing my pump? Like, you haven't even got it yet. Like, yeah, we, you, you need to go harder. They're almost like old wives' tales in terms of some of the some of that sort of stuff, and that's why you know to go back to alcohol. Sometimes we still do see it. I still just shake my head because I'm like. You'll see someone doing a shot backstage and it's like, all right, you're ingesting alcohol. And then in an hour, you're going to start pushing in or half an hour, you're going to hydrate. That isn't making its way into the blood. It's not going where you want it to go. You're not going to be able to store and partition that because one is preventing the other from being able to be to be utilized and maximized. So it's just, it just makes no sense. People think that there's just these magical things that you can do and it just does all this crazy stuff. It's like when you see certain athletes, oh my God, like, how did you peak them? Well, we dieted for like 30 odd weeks. We got inside out peeled. And then all we really did was push in some more carbohydrate. We relaxed and then uh, an acute dose of sodium to just increase blood pressure, vascularity, and then magic. So moral of the story is if you're taking alcohol at that time, your body's now going to be spending its time and energy and focus on trying to metabolize and digest that. Yeah. Yeah. 
above and beyond any kind of carbs or honey that you're trying to take in at that time. That's it. It's not even going to concentrate on that. That's just going to the gut and we're going to stay there until it sorts out this alcohol. So, mm-hmm. all right, let's change the pace a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about training. So, and this is good because we're online coaches, right? So when clients tag you in workout videos and their form doesn't look right, do you message them to correct their form? MG? Good one. Yeah, sometimes like I haven't reached, I haven't reshared videos because I thought the form wasn't great. And equally, I have reshared videos that I thought the form wasn't great, but have sent the athlete a message. Mm-hmm. But typically what I do, I think you guys are the same, is like when I'm looking at form checks, I'm probably asking for specific videos on specific exercises each week that I then review in a checkout video. I can't say I'm sitting down and watching the tagged video with, you know, a, a microscope to to do a bit of analysis on, you know, form, tempo, you know, in overall intensity. I'm probably asking for more specific videos than that. But yes, I would send someone a message if something was off. But equally, I have also posted videos that, you know, maybe the form wasn't spot on. But again, you know, there are there are a number of factors that go in. And something that I said in my athletes regularly, it's like you really don't know the context of where they were in their workout, what set was it. And, you know, sometimes, you know, I might prescribe an athlete a weight and say, oh, I want you to do three sets at 40 and then I want you to do the last set at 50. And, and as a coach, I'm not expecting that, you know, every rep on that fourth set at 50 is going to be perfect because it's the first time that athletes tried that weight and maybe the first six will be great and the last four will be pretty shit. But they're going to try and hit 10 because that's what I wrote on their program that week. I want them to do 10. So I'm also of the understanding that in our game and in the sport that we're in at the intensity that, you know, certainly the three of us like to train at, not every rep is always going to be perfect, but our job and objective is to do our best to ensure that it's as close to that as possible. But I totally understand, you know, with my athletes and even with myself, that sometimes we all do a couple of shitty reps, but I'm not going to necessarily not post that video just because, you know, it wasn't perfect. If I thought that their intensity was good and I thought that they were giving 100%, then I'm happy to reshare it. And I don't really give a fuck about what anyone else out there thinks about it and I don't need to justify myself to anyone else about one of my athletes form. Exactly. How about you, Scotty? Similar like w- with what MG touched on, my athletes will have, depending on their meso and depending on the individual, but there'll always be certain exercises that as a mandatory, it's part of their check-in that they'll send me footage on and equally they'll just send me exercises if they want me to look at. So most days I'll look at probably at least 30 or 40 different sets of athletes that they'll send through and then I'll usually download them, watch them back. If it's something that you need to do, then I'll clip it and then highlight some of the things and then just send a voice recording on what you would tidy up. But I think in today's society, and this is something that it's kind of a little pet peeve of mine at the moment, that there's just in a an RPE, RIR, a lot of the literature supporting like you don't have to go to complete and utter failure to be able to make gains. You know, you only need to go to one or two reps in reserve. I feel like as a a community a lot of bodybuilders now have just gone a little bit fucking soft in terms of like forgetting you actually have to train hard to create a stimulus in order to elicit that adaptation and for most people i would argue their perception of what is one or two in reserve is very very different to what i would deem or perhaps what you boys would deem as this is what mechanical or muscular failure actually looks like and so the only way to really know that is Every once in a while, you, you need to just test the waters and see where it lands. Now, you're not trying to just move the load from A to B. So you have to have that awareness of depositing direct stress to the targeted tissue that you're, you're trying to focus on. But I think that there's a lot of exercise mechanic police that just roam through the internet. Don't get me wrong. If someone does something wrong, and we've all seen it, rather than taking a video or trying to belt them down, go and give them some 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 feedback or maybe some support or give some assistance in terms of how they can tidy it up because at the end of the day, everyone was once a beginner. But I think if it's a pattern and it's constantly the mechanics of the lift are just wrong, then is you sharing it going to be beneficial for them? No, you just communicate to them and then let them know, I want you to try this and this. But I don't think people should be you know bashed over social media for putting something up. They might be really, really proud. Maybe they lift 100 kilos for the first time. Maybe it is a, you know, a pretty messy rep. But equally, as long as it's not being uploaded every day and it still looks like that, if it's not progressively getting better, then sure, maybe you can be like, I reckon maybe you need to be a little bit more mindful of what you're doing because you don't want to get injured and you're not really serving a purpose. Because again, as bodybuilders, the goal is not to move the load from A to B. 
it's to deposit stress and create a stimulus. So I think it depends which side you, you know, you're, you're looking at that, but I think we should always be trying to teach and enhance and no one ever has everything perfect. Like I can put my hand up and say that I still video every single deadlift set that I'll do purely to watch it back, make sure that it was good before I'll move up. Um, and there's some sets you'd be like, fuck that last rep. It just wasn't really there. But equally, if you didn't shoot and try and take it, maybe you don't know whether you are at that upper echelon. You might have pulled it out with, I think I only had one left. But unless you actually try and take that last rep, you don't know whether maybe I have another one and then another one. And so I think you, you can't be afraid to test your limits and find out where, you know, those actual true one rep in reserve or failure lies because otherwise there's a very good chance that you're leaving gains on the table. I look at some of the the biggest, most muscular athletes that I've worked with and they're equally all psychos in the way that they train. They're, you know, willing to go to that place that others aren't. And it's people like, oh, that person just has good genetics. Well, maybe they do have some good genetics, but equally they probably train a hell of a lot harder than what you do. So I think, yeah, a lot of people could benefit of just not saying we have to just sacrifice form completely, but you, you need to test the waters from time to time. Yeah, I completely agree with you guys. And I give people feedback on their form if they need it. But also on that count too, Scotty, I give feedback on their intensity too. If I think that they could have pushed a little bit harder in that set and things were just moving a little mm. bit too easy. And I thought, okay, you can definitely go up. You had more in the tank on that one too. So it's good. I, I like people tagging me and filming their workouts because it's only going to help me help them even more to give them that feedback. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys watch a bit of this stuff. Actually, Scotty, I think you do. But you know that young kid, Sam Sulek? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like he's obviously blown up and people have got mixed opinions on him. I fucking love the kid, to be honest, man. But he did a video the other day. He's like, he's like, ah, leave five reps in the tank. Said no massive person ever. <laughs> he's right. Yep. He's fucking right. He is. And I was, I was just to finish on that. I was going to say, if you're someone that does perhaps doesn't have a coach and just uses this podcast as an educational platform, the easiest way to gauge whether your perception of your reps in reserve is correct is watch back your training videos. And if there is no change in your rep cadence, especially during the concentric phase, then whenever you concluded your set, it shouldn't have been your last rep because we should see a reduction in the speed in which, you know, the muscle is contracting. Because if you don't, then you're showing that there's still plenty to go there. Mm -hmm. Good point. Uh, let's move over to some coaching questions. Uh, I'm going to kind of group these a little bit. How do you break up with a coach when they are super nice, but they just don't have enough experience? Thoughts on swapping coach mid-season? And how do you guys keep athletes for so long? So I don't know, MG, maybe you want to tackle it. There's no easy answer for the first one, unfortunately, right? The best thing I think that you can do is be honest and end it as quickly as you feel like it's not right for you. I think we've all had instances where, you know, potentially we may have had a chat with an athlete who was looking to switch and it's like, oh, I'll just sit it out and didn't and then regretted it in the end and wish that they probably had it. But I actually had an example today of an athlete who came in for a chat and sat out last season with their coach, someone that they trained with who had another coach who had the same coach actually swapped over to one of you boys and um, and had a very, very successful season. And now she's sitting back going, oh, I wish I had made that, that same switch. So I think, yeah, the best thing that you can do is speak to your coach about how you're feeling. If, if I can speak on behalf of all coaches out there, we certainly don't expect every athlete to be with us until the end of time. If I was a coach out there who was potentially lagging in some areas and someone gave me some feedback, I would personally be able to have a look at myself and look at my systems and utilize that to improve. If you have a conversation with your coach and they don't look at it in that manner, well, then it's probably another reason why they're not the right coach for you. So I think do it, do it as soon as you realize it's not right and have a good, genuine conversation with your coach about what's going on. From a switching perspective, I don't think sitting it out and hoping it's going to get better is a good strategy either because in most cases, it's only going to get worse. If you feel like the level of communication, the systems, the plans that they've implemented or the lack of plan and strategy that they have in place isn't good now, as the show gets closer, it's going to get worse. And potentially when you need them most, they're not going to be there for you. How do we keep clients for so long? Uh, I think all three of us and, you know, all good coaches that are in the industry are really good at mapping out long-term plans. I think it's multifaceted. I think it comes down to one 
the systems that we use, the way that we communicate, the way that we check in, our level of expertise and how long we've been doing it for is one part. But I think ultimately, because we're all really good at mapping out long-term plans and periodizing long-term plans for athletes that can stretch up as far as two to three years at times, we have our athletes committed for longer periods of time because they're invested in the process and journey because we've spent the time to map out what that long-term plan looks like. So I think that would be one big part about it. But I think the second part is when you've got really, really good systems and when you've proven that you have a track record of getting results, you tend to keep athletes for longer periods of time. What do you think, Scotty? Yeah, everything MG said, I agree. I finish on what you were saying about leaving your, your coach. It's, it's one of those things where if you are unhappy in any situation in terms of anything that you're doing in life, you know, it's like the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. So to simplify it, nothing changes if nothing changes. So if you're not getting what you need to get out of it, whether it's from a, an educational perspective, if it's from a results perspective, if it's a care, because every athlete is going to gel and bond with a coach differently to one another. And that's what, you know, the way that MT coaches versus MG versus me, we're all very, very different. Yeah, we might all, you know, hold similar philosophies around how we do things and why we do things the way we do them. But as people, we're all uniquely different. So some people are just going to vibe a little bit better than others. And so sometimes they just have that instant rapport. But I think if you're not getting that and you're not having that care and compassion, I think that's the biggest thing to, to, in terms of, how you retain your clients when you actually really care and you're passionate and you take what you you know what you do very seriously i think it's pretty easy to be able to to hold on to to your clients because they should feel that care and they should feel that commitment and that passion from you every single week in their check in but if you're someone that views i want 50 athletes so that i can charge 100 bucks a week i can make 5 grand i'll do six check ins a day and i'll just go bang 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 and i just pump them out and they're all generic and they're cookie cutter plans. It's an easy lifestyle. It's an easy job. Apparently it's just, you're never going to last. You know, I think a lot of people get the wrong idea in terms, don't get me wrong. Online coaching offers phenomenal flexibility and it's awesome to work for yourself, but equally you don't just punch out macros. Like when you open someone's checking, you're going through all of their data, or at least you're making your notes going through all of that. So some check-ins may take 45 minutes to an hour longer in peak week, other times it might be very clear cut. Yep. Everything's good. You know, you're going through your progressions and you can pump it out, but it all sort of evens out. But the athlete would never know that you'd spend an hour or you'd spend five minutes because regardless the demeanor that you're speaking in, the care that you're giving, the response time, the consistency, you check in on a Monday, your check-in comes back on a Monday night or first thing on a Tuesday morning. They're all things that I guess, give your service validity. And in terms of an athlete who is serious about their bodybuilding, you know, it's it's almost like, you know, you're the the missing piece that they've been looking for to be able to, to gel it all together. So you're going to have athletes that come and go, but I think it just comes down to being passionate and being committed to your athletes and what you do. And I think if you enjoy what you do, then it really isn't an arduous task to be able to offer, you know, a really, really good service provided that all of your systems are in place. Yeah, I completely agree with everything that you boys said. To go back on the, you know, breaking up or leaving a coach, just to add one thing, is if you have that honest conversation with a coach, they're professional, they should take it professionally, and they understand that people come and go sometimes, and it's okay. And you should just wish everyone the best and just support them in whatever endeavor or choice they make. So that's one thing I just wanted to add there. The other thing about mm -hmm. how we keep clients for so long just agreeing with everything that you guys said, but I think one of the biggest things I find and the reasons why people leave their coach, one of the key ones is communication. You know, not being consistent with communication and also not being punctual with communication too. So if anyone's to take anything away from this and if they're thinking about the reasons why they're losing clients is really looking to how you're communicating with your clients, making sure that you really care and you put them at the forefront and really make every interaction with them meaningful and that you're really trying to help them so that they can be their absolute best and you care as much as they care. Because you've got to think, they're putting a lot of trust in you to make them look their absolute best and put them on stage half naked being judged against other people. It's a massive commitment. They need to go through a lot of weeks of doing things consistently so there's a lot of trust they have in you. So make sure that you really take it seriously 
and you give the best service you possibly can with the abilities that you do have. And I think one of the other things that you kind of mentioned too, Scotty, is you can't be self-centered. They need to be the focal point. If you're on your social media and you're showing everyone on how hard you're working, if you're taking photos of you working or videos of you working, you're not working. <laughs> you're telling everyone you're working, but you're really not putting any effort into, into your job. You'll never see any of us do, do that because we're just too fucking busy and we're working too fucking hard for our clients to give them the absolute best. We don't care about what it looks like from an outsider's perspective. And if people know that we're an online coach and we're living our good life because we're not, we're working big hours and putting a lot of energy into everyone more energy than what the money's worth to be honest so if you're in this to to make dollars and to make money and that's what how you see everyone as you're not going to retain them for as long as what we're retaining our clients yep 100 percent. okay let's move on to another one just a fun one scotty if you only could pick four supplements what would they be whey isolate creatine caffeine citrulline malate for the pumps you know what's so funny is the person put EG and they listed four things and you picked three out of the four. Whey, caffeine, creatine. They said fish oil, but I can understand how supplements might throw you off to like vitamins and minerals and things like that, right? If but, it was to add a vitamin, then it wouldn't be fish oil. It'd be vitamin D3, D, purely yeah. for the immunological gains. Yeah, knew that. How about you, MG? And let's go SUPS as a separate thing. And then if you want to add in some like key vitamins and minerals that you recommend, you can chuck them in on the end as your, as your bonus uh, points. Mine would be the same. I Man, I've had, I've fallen in love with citrulline more and more over the last like, man, three or four months. I have this connection in my brain now that I train like shit without citrulline, man. <laughs> the pump is so different for me, I promise. Like, I don't know whether I'm just like sensitive to it or what, man, but... The, the difference for not having citrulline and having citrulline is literally night and day for me, man. So it would be the same. The only other thing that I would throw in would be Lego. <laughs> Lego. <laughs> man, do you want to hear something funny? You know how many people, how many listeners have messaged me and have now gotten into Lego? And you know how much I fucking love it? Man, Lego was like my thing. You, you know me, like I've got an engineering background, right? So like building stuff as a kid, that was my thing. I, I loved Lego. Absolutely love Lego. Get on board. But to answer the question seriously, the only other thing to throw on top of that would be magnesium. Okay. Yeah, I love it. I'd be the same. Whey, caffeine, creatine, and citrulline. And then adding in, if you wanted to add in some like bonus vitamins and minerals, fish oil, vitamin D would probably be the main ones. Scotty, do you find when you're analyzing like some people's blood tests coming out the back end of prep, or even if they've just gone through the reverse or kind of coming out the back end of that, do you find that there's common deficiencies that you see. For me, with the females, I see folate, B12, and iron. As kind of, if I'm just going to pick my top three most common, they're kind of the top three that I see. And they're normally the, the top three you'll see with most females, to be honest, man. If you go and get a random female off the street, they'll usually have those three markers down. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll also notice, I notice it in my blood panel, um, even with EVs, just see, you know, changes to some of the, like on the lower end, at least, you know, things like your neutrophils, all of your immunological markers are on the bottom end. So things like that, a lot of people will look at a blood panel and just be focusing on testosterone, free testosterone, estradiol and things like that versus I'll also like to look at, okay, we may not have had anything flagged in terms of any of those, you know, leukocytes, neutrophils, et cetera, that are on the lower range, you may not be too, they may not be concerned with that. But as someone who's coming from a, a place of lower energy availability for a long period of time, it's, it's not as bad if you're going into summer where you guys are. But with me over in the UK, everyone over here now is starting to get sick because there's less sunlight. It's a lot colder now. Um, and so things like that, you need to be really, really mindful of. So it's like you would be wanting to, get as much vitamins and minerals, antioxidants with a food first approach first. So I'm like, like what I just said before, if you're flexible dieting, just make sure every meal that you're having, you've got at least three or four different colors. When you're having veggies or salad, three or four different colors so that you're getting a mixed profile of what you need. And then you should have all of that back on that higher end range if you're making good choices and you're not eating like an asshole and just trying to have donuts for pre-workout that should sort of self out within the first three months. Yeah. But there's some of the big things that I'll, I'll look at 
obviously the main ones with you know sex profile and whatnot in terms of the endochronological component but from a i guess an overall holistic perspective they're some of the ones that you would definitely be um be looking at and just being mindful of you know maximizing so if you're taking vitamin d it's a fat soluble vitamin make sure you're taking it with some um taking it with some fats if you're taking folic acid you know take it with some vitamin c for absorption things like that yeah awesome i'm going to end on one more thing because i just want to ask you you mentioned about pre-workouts obviously now you go into like a public gym i don't know how hardcore it is but are you seeing like anyone with like their pre-workout tubs and what brands are they using or are you see anyone with like pre-workout drinks and what's like the most common one you're seeing in the gym at the moment i haven't really there's a the gym we train in a gym called david lloyd's which is it's a I think I explained what it was. Anyway, it's kind of it's a little bit wanky. A lot of the athletes over here train at it because it's got all of the nice facilities. And so there's a lot of there's not a whole lot of bodybuilders. There's a lot of people that maybe think their body like last <laughs> yesterday afternoon I'm training. It's minus whatever it was. It's freezing, and I'm in. I'm still always wearing shorts, but I'm wearing a couple of layers, and I'm doing SLDLs. And there's a guy who's just walked into the gym in shorts, like full night kit, Nike singlet, visor, and he's doing bicep curls and he's letting the world know he's doing them. But equally, it wasn't a great set. And he, you know, I wouldn't say he's on the muscular side of of, uh, of things, but so it's it's probably a different demographic, but a lot of them do have that. And a lot of people drink monsters, but they have a lot of vending machines in most of the gyms, even upstairs where you can just buy a, uh, a pre-workout but i haven't really paid a lot of attention in terms of what people are getting i actually just had to order some protein yesterday because all the stuff i brought over has run out so i've gone with my protein and i actually mm. ordered one of the pre-workouts so i'll let you know if it's any good that's the they're probably the biggest brands over here that and um most of the athletes will take um sis so we use that at, at um at the salaries because they're approved so they're not on the i think it's the uk version of like wada so it's basically certified it has that green tick so they know you can take it and not be risk of you know testing positive for banned substances but i'll do some recon for you and i'll come back to you and let you know what everyone's taken awesome and anyone come up to, to you at the gym yet and just be like do you lift bro you must lift uh not really. When I was training, there's a, there was a couple of times where right before my shows where I got down to maybe a singlet just to see how I was looking with a punt with Jen. And there was a lot of people just staring like not really having seen that before. And I think because I'm always wearing powerhouse hoodie or whatever when I'm there, people sort of stare at it. There's, it's funny. There's a few people that work there that started following me on um on on social media but i don't really put much stuff up as you guys know i'm not all that active on it so i think people definitely look like i was doing deadlifts yesterday and there wasn't anyone else really deadlifting they've got one of the reasons i like this gym they've got alico bars they've got platform so it's amazing to to go on an alico platform but i wasn't doing anything crazy i think it was i was doing sldls it was like 190 or something like that but there were people like watching as if like maybe most people don't do that but equally i would look at that and be like there's people that I train like big Zach's probably doing his second warm up set on that. Do you know what I mean? So I don't view that as being it's, but it's, it's a different type of gym. It's not like if Matty Orchard went in there, they look at him like, you know, the rocks in the house because it's like, they've never seen a human that looks like that or lifts those sort of weights. But, um, but it's good. And that's one of the reasons why I like it as well. Cause you kind of just anything that I want to use when I need it, like no one's ever really making the most of their squat rack slash platforms. But um they have Life Fitness over here. Life Fitness and Techno Gym are the two real main pieces that a lot of the big gyms have. So what you're trying to say is you're pretty much the biggest and the strongest person in the gym. Oh, I don't you know, know about that. I haven't, I haven't trained at all the different hours to see what everyone else is, is doing. But equally, no one would know because I, I don't ever really get out of my, my hoodie. I stay pretty covered up. I can't wait till the day where someone goes, I listen to your podcast. Yeah, I haven't had anyone here yet that does. Uh, or that has told me that they they that they listen to. It. I've had a lot of people start following me on on socials, but no one that's come up and um and uh, and said anything yet. Maybe I have to start giving a bit of a plug. We need to get some of the t shirts out. Yeah, true. Yeah, uh, awesome. You guys should just come over for a weekend, and we'll just get after it and get a session. Man, you do not need to tempt me, but just the temperature. I don't know about the weather, bro, but you don't need to tempt me. Yeah, you'd be getting off. You'd need a beanie, snooty, the big jackets. Yeah, gonna need everything. Yeah. Oh, it was good yeah. catching up, bro. As always, thanks well, for listening. Boys. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you all next time.